days for Christmas shopping, 15 days to fill the stocking, 15 days for Christmas shopping, only got 15 more. Hi, have you done your Christmas shopping? You better hurry up or you'll be sorry. Shopgear.com The following is a presentation of the Gear Radio Network. You're listening to the Better Live and Dead podcast on the Gear Radio Network. And with that, we welcome you to the Better Live Than Dead podcast, powered by Better Live Than Dead and the Gear Radio Network. This is episode 158. 158. Dude, that's awesome. It is NFL Week 14 cast. I am Ryan Wolf at Wolf BLTD. Joining me on the IndyCard Media Hotline, the man himself, Mr. Perez at MRLG Perez. Lewis, how you doing today? Hey, man, I'm doing very, very well. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing well. It's a nice Tuesday afternoon, about 3 o'clock here on December 10th, breaking down the fourth wall, finishing yeah, up yeah. my lunch break, talking some NFL sports with uh, one of my favorites. I appreciate that. I'm looking forward to uh, getting rid of this one. Nice little tire pump there for you. Hey, before we get started, though, Lewis, you can hear us on BetterLiveThanDead.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, YouTube, and wherever else you listen to podcasts, you can get this podcast. Also, we check the numbers on the back end. A big shout out to our listeners over on the Bullhorn Podcast app. We see you, and we appreciate you listening in. With that being said, Lewis, week 14, come and gone in the books, and we're looking back now. We're going to start off hot and heavy with the three big things brought to you by fortunephoto.com. And the best part about this one, for the third straight week, the first of the three big things does not change. That's right, everybody. It's Let's Get Lewis Mad About the Cowboys, the threequel, which, Lewis, I did not know was a movie term. Apparently, I knew it was like the the first movie, the sequel, and then the third movie. But apparently, you can call it the threequel. The Chicago Bears defeat the Dallas Cowboys 31-24. to Lewis, tell me how this makes you feel. Oh, man, listen, it makes me feel wonderful. No, nah, not at all. It, 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 we, uh, that's how I feel about it right there. <laughs> Perfect. That's exactly how I feel about well, it. Well, if, if you need a second to gather yourself, uh, I can just let you know, Dallas falls to 6-7 and seven on the season, but they hold the lead in the NFC East due to a 4-0 record in the NFC East. Now, Lewis, mentioning the game, talking about how, how things have gone right but not right for the Dallas Cowboys this season, even if they lose uh, to the Rams next week and Philly beats Washington, which we expect that to happen despite the fact that Philadelphia did lose to Miami earlier this year, Dallas will be on the outside looking in, needing to win out. They face Philadelphia in Week 16 to determine the NFC East lead, and then Week 17 they have a matchup against Washington. But as I mentioned before, Dallas is undefeated against the NFC East this season, so they're beating up on their own kind, but everyone else is beating up on them, it seems. It's utterly ridiculous. They did the same thing this week. First drive, they go down, they score a touchdown, they look good, and then they forget how to freaking play football. It's been utterly ridiculous. They scored a couple of scores in in garbage time, which is what they've been doing. It's just been utterly ridiculous. Stupid. Yeah, they do a very good job of padding the stat sheets, but uh, when it comes down to actually trying to win the football game, it doesn't seem like they have any interest in that. Right. It really doesn't. Unless as dumb as that the, sounds. They, yeah, it really doesn't, unless they're playing their own division. I Look at and the crazy part is, is that they there is a path for them to still win the division, despite the fact that they are... Six and seven, they could prop, they could win the division at eight and eight, winning out as long as they can defeat Philadelphia. But, excuse me, the big thing here is that if they defeat the Rams, then they can clinch the division against Philadelphia in week 16. So, right. It's crazy. I mean, Dallas has played poor, but they still find themselves in a position to succeed. It's like you, you, you fall in crap, you still smell like roses. Yeah, they should not be playing as poor as they have been. And frankly, they they should not, you know, the, 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 the fact that they're possibly able to clinch a playoff spot is almost laughable at this point. And this is it, my it, team I'm talking about. It's a bigger issue, too, because you're going to have an 8-8 eight and eight Dallas Cowboys team or a 7-9 and nine Eagles team or an 8-8 eight eight Eagles team or a 7-9 and nine Cowboys team make the playoffs and host a playoff right. game against a 10, 11, or probably a 12 or 13 win team at this point. That's right. insane. It is. It really is. I agree now, with you there. 
Now, when when they inevitably fire Jason Garrett, do you want Urban Meyer to be the head coach? No. Who do you want? I'm not sure. I'd have to think about it. I don't. I, don't I mean, know you, you look Meyer at you look at the names. Too. You've got Urban Meyer from Ohio State, formerly of Ohio State, uh, of Tim Tebow fame from Florida. Uh, you've right. got you've got uh, Sean Payton, ex Cowboys assistant, uh, now Saints head coach, but likely he'll stay in New Orleans. I don't think that that's going to happen. Um, you've got some, I'd be cool some Sean Payton. I think the only thing, I think the one name to probably pay attention to, and I know we're kind of jumping a little head here, but it's probably is Lincoln Riley from uh, Oklahoma, mostly because he's been a, he's like that next Sean McVay type hire, I believe, where he's, he's right. been very good pumping up. I mean, they had three years in a row. They had, um, who was the quarterback before they had Baker Mayfield win the Heisman. They had Kyler Murray win the Heisman. And now there, there's potential that, that uh, Jalen hurts could win the Heisman. I don't think he will but there's a potential that he could win the Heisman Trophy. He's, he's one of the four finalists. I think that speaks a lot to the, the program that Lincoln Riley runs there in Oklahoma. And yeah, I agree. thinking about it, outside looking in, there's no bigger opportunity for him to make a splash in the National Football League than with the Dallas Cowboys. You're going to have a, a, an owner GM who wants to win, who will give you everything he can to win. You'll have Dak Prescott, likely. You're definitely going to have Ezekiel Elliott. I mean, you could, if if all plays out well, you'll still have a good defense. You'll have Amari Cooper, hopefully for them. But there's a lot of good pieces in Dallas that would make it attractive to a to a young uh, young head coach like Lincoln Riley. But I just don't know if if Jerry Jones is smart enough to do that. Yeah, at this point, looking at what Jerry's been doing, I, I don't know if he is either. It's 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 getting ridiculous. If nothing else, I hope he gets. I hope Jason Garrett gets fired and then hired by the New York Giants. That'd be hilarious. That would be hilarious. Now, speaking of hilarity here, uh, we're looking at the, I just scrolled down my screen too far. We are looking at the week 14 rewind, the second of the three big things this week, as usual. Looking back, it was week 14. I put 13. I didn't, I didn't fix my sheet here. Yeah, that's why I was. You didn't fix your sheet, man. What's up? Yeah. It happens. It happens. I'm, I'm a little slow sometimes when it comes to editing, but I've got all the pertinent information here. The Atlanta That's Falcons, defe- the Atlanta Falcons defeat the Carolina Panthers forty to twenty. Now, Lewis, the big deal here: Matt Ryan, Atlanta quarterback, twenty for thirty-four, three hundred and thirteen yards, two touchdowns with one rush for eight yards, he becomes the tenth quarterback in NFL history to reach fifty thousand passing yards, the second fastest quarterback to reach that mark. He did it in one hundred eighty-six games. Only Drew Brees at one hundred eighty-three games reached it quicker. I'll tell you what, Matt Ryan could certainly be in the upper echelon of quarterbacks in the National Football League if the Falcons weren't consistently so bad. Also, if they hadn't blown that 28-3 to lead in the Super Bowl. No, I absolutely agree with you. He's, you know, he looked good. He he always puts up great numbers. He's, like you said, he's reached 50,000 passing yards, second fastest to do it. Yeah, no, if they put better, you know, pieces around him, they might be a little more dangerous. I think defensively they need they need help defensively. I mean, their head coach is not great. I, I presume he'll get fired. Gus, uh, not Gus Bradley, it's the other guy. Can't remember his name. Either way, um, he was the old he was an old Seattle defensive coordinator. He'll probably end up as a defensive coordinator somewhere and be fine. But the defensive piece is there. It doesn't seem like something's just not clicking. I mean, offensively they have Matt Ryan, they have uh, Julio Jones, they have Calvin Ridley, who Calvin Ridley looks like a stud despite the fact that he, I believe, may have torn his abdomen or something. He's out for the rest of the, the last two games the rest of the year. Um, they have Devonta Freeman in the backfield. I mean, they have Austin Hooper at tight end. There's a lot of good pieces there, and you just wonder why they can't consistently win with those pieces. And uh, I, I think it's probably a, a head coaching thing, but I guess we'll find out. Yeah, I mean, you don't, you don't hear as much about their pieces as you do, let's say, the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, Absolutely. You know, so it's almost like what's going on over there also. I I, I certainly agree there. It's it's I don't know if it's a defensive thing because it, it they've they've had the ability to to win games. They've they've beaten some some teams and, and surprised some had some surprising victories this season. But with that being said, again, <laughs> Dan Quinn's our head coach, by the way. I apologize. Uh they, they there's just something something's not working there and it seems like the message might be stale and it, it might be time to move on but uh moving on nice transition there to the game of the week man san francisco defeats new orleans 48 to 46 and what could potentially be an nfc championship or playoff matchup 
I hope we see this game again. It was 48 to 46, as mentioned. The reason that's so important, Lewis, it was a score agami. It was the 1,053rd unique score in the National Football League history. I don't know why that was so hard to say that, but it was. San Francisco quarterback <laughs> Jimmy Garoppolo, 26 for 35, 349 yards, four touchdowns, one interception with two rushes for one yard. And New Orleans quarterback Drew Brees, 29 for 40, 349 yards, five touchdowns, and one rush for one yard with one touchdown. That being mentioned, the third time since 1950 that two opposing players have had the same exact number of passing yards with a minimum of 300 passing yards each. Brady and Luck did it. uh, Tom Brady and Andrew Luck did it uh, in week six of 2015 with each having 312 yards. And Michael Vick and Matt Stafford back week six of 2012 had 311 passing yards. That's a very specific stat, but also very impressive. Yeah, no, it's super impressive to know that both QBs put up 349 yards it's kind of bananas. Uh, and, of course, you know, Garoppolo had the four CDs and Drew Brees with the five. That's just – that's a lot of scoring going on. Yeah, and those defenses aren't good. bad. I mean, San Francisco's defense is one of the best in the league, but it just seemed like a day where you just hold on for dear life and hope to God that you're on top at the end of the game. Oh, yeah. I mean, you had two high-powered offenses just slugging it out, and it was an incredible game. Well, and- I, I like defensive battle games. But I also like these type of games. And this was well, that you, it's game a good point you mentioned because the the Bills and the the Bills and Ravens game. I had it on the TV at my in laws' house, and then I also had Forty ers and and Saints on my on my laptop. So I'm watching them both at the same time, and I'm like, while I do respect a good defensive battle, I just like it sometimes when the top gets ripped off, and it's just insane. Right? No, I absolutely 100 percent agree. This was a fun game to watch, and especially the way it ended too. George Kittle had that late catch with a face mask where he was going beast mode, and then he gets face masks, so that, that ends up being a 53-yard gain, push him in a field goal range. They get the 30-yard field goal with time expiring by Robbie Gold. They win the game. They move up. It looks like they're they're in a good spot to get a bye, to get one of the two buys in the NFC, and that team continues to be dangerous. They have a couple injuries on the, on the defensive side. D Ford, Richard Sherman have some hamstring problems. They'll likely miss the last two games of the regular season, plus if they get – um if they get that bye week, they can have up to four weeks to get healthy. So it, it's it's pretty good news right. for them on that front, despite the fact that injuries are obviously bad. But uh, San Francisco set themselves, themselves up good. New Orleans is going to be hard to beat in the playoffs too. But it might be something where if this team can score 45, 50 points at ease, it's going to be hard to beat them. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. I, I You know, it, it'll be interesting, interesting to see. It, what happens once they reach the playoffs? I mean, if they get that by, like you said, that will definitely help. Uh, it, it's it's been unexpected. I don't think anyone saw this coming from San Fran. Not no, and the, and the fact that they've been able to consistently keep it up has been amazing as well. Now, speaking of strange games, Lewis, we go from a high scoring one to a lower scoring game, but interesting for a different reason. The Jets defeat the Dolphins twenty two to twenty one. Now. New York Jets kicker Sam Ficken had a 48-yard game-winning field goal as time expired. That's the longest game-winning field goal in Jets history. But here's the interesting thing. Ten combined field goals, that's right, ten, is the most in a single game in NFL history. Miami kicker Jason Sanders, seven for eight on the day. If he went eight for eight, maybe the Dolphins would have won the game. But uh, seven for eight on field goal kicks, he made a 22, 25, 28, 31, 53, 47, and 37. He missed a 34-yard field goal in the third quarter, probably kicking himself, no pun intended, uh, for missing that one. But again, the Jets defeat the Dolphins 22 to 21, and the Jets almost, they've lost games in weird ways this year. I think getting out field goal kicked would have been probably up there. Yeah, that, that'd be a really strange way to lose a game. But that's, you know, 21 points strictly on the field goals. How I don't think I've ever seen that. No, and I think that's – I can hear John maniacally laughing in the background just watching the game, just uh, just losing his damn mind because, again, it's uh, – <laughs> it's, it's, right. it's hard to just – to it's like you watch someone um, just slowly bleeding out and there's nothing you can do about it, and you're like, oh, my God, are we going to survive or is this it? Right, right, right. Yeah, that's <laughs> – that's weird. It's it's a weird way to, to lose a game, but it's a weird way to score all of your points, especially when you eclipse the 20-point uh, mark. It's crazy because um, 
it, it, it blows my mind that not only do they kick seven field goals, but then the um, then the the Jets actually won on a game winning field goal. Right, it's amazing. No, I agree. It is amazing. Uh, let's see here. Now moving over to Denver, they shock a lot of people in the National Football League. Defeat Houston thirty eight to twenty four. Houston coming off a big win last week. It stopped in their tracks. Denver quarterback Drew Locke, twenty two of twenty seven. 309 yards, three touchdowns, one interception. He had three rushes for 15 yards as well. Drew Locke, 2-0 in his first two career starts. He's the first rookie since 1950 to have at least 300 passing yards and three touchdowns in his first career road start. Now, Lewis, since the 2012 season, John Elway has historically struck out on starting quarterbacks post Peyton Manning, uh, Brock Osweiler, Trevor Semyon, Paxton Lynch, Case Keenum, Joe Flacco, and Brandon Allen have all started at least one game. Now, Drew Locke is two games into his career. Uh, so he has two starts with the Broncos since uh, in the post Peyton Manning era. Is Drew Locke the quarterback of the future in Denver, or or do you uh, do you uh, I guess proceed with caution, kind of buyer beware, despite the fact that he's had a lot of success in two games? You know, two games is two games. I, I'd say buyer beware. Although he did beat you know a, a good Houston team. I don't remember who they beat last week. They beat the or, Patriots. Or they, they, well, Houston oh, beat right. the Patriots. Be, What'd say? Houston beat the Patriots. I don't. I don't know who Denver Houston beat. Houston beat the Patriots. Uh, yeah. So I mean, it's one of those things where it's too early to really give him any type of. Yeah, this is the guy. Uh, we'll have to see what happens in the next couple of days. I mean, Denver. Days. Denver defeated the Chargers, and then they defeated Houston with Drew Locke under center. Okay, that's actually pretty impressive. Um. But I still want to say, let's take it slow. We don't know, you know, because they've also put up some the, – the team has put up some goose eggs this year that it just looked terrible. Yeah. So, you know, because their defense isn't great. So, we'll we'll see what happens. I, he's looked good. He's got Absolutely. good numbers he's, for two he's, games. He's shown potential. That's, that's what people want to see out of it is potential because, again, John Elway has not been good with drafting quarterbacks since becoming the general manager of the Denver Broncos, despite the fact that he himself, a pretty good quarterback. Right. Yeah, that Brock Osweiler deal was terrible. Yeah, that was pretty rough. But, hey, good for Brock Osweiler. Set for life and his kids and his kids' kids will probably never have to do anything in their life and they'll be super rich. So perfect. Speaking of the New England. 20, 22 or 27 with 309 yards, that's. That's a nice stat line. For for a rookie, not bad at all. And a second start, not bad at all. Right. Now, speaking of the Patriots, they lose to Kansas City 23-16. to Future Hall of Famer Patrick Mahomes, he's got that moniker back now. 26 of 40, 283 yards, one touchdown, one pick, and six rushes for six yards. Excuse me. I presume after the season we're going to find out that he's been battling some very bad, gross, uncomfortable, whatever, nagging injuries because he did not look right out there, but he was playing through everything. He hurt his hand. He, he's got a knee problem. He's got a, you know, he's got a limp. He's just not – he doesn't look like himself. But he's still out there oh, slinging a ball and uh, enough for the, the Chiefs to win and, and, and bump the Patriots down another notch. Yes, they won. They bumped the Patriots down another notch. And I'm not one to give the Patriots props, but let's be honest, there was a missed call. The Patriots probably should have won that game. You know, I hate to sound like a little a bitch, I guess, but you know what? It's nice that one of those missed calls goes against them for once. That's just my no, fan hat. I, I completely agree with you 100%. It's nice that I went against them, but they probably should have won that game. I mean, that definitely was a touchdown for Enkil Harry, no doubt about it. Absolutely, 100%. But, hey, let's let's give credit where credit's due. Kansas City's defense, they held Tom Brady to 4.7 yards per completion. They held New England's offense to 94 total rushing yards. And, hey, a little feather in the cap, nice little celebration afterwards. Kansas City clinched the AFC West with the victory, so they will be in the playoffs coming up here in a few weeks. Now, looking over to another playoff team, the Seattle Seahawks, they shockingly get uh, get beat up a little by the Los Angeles Rams. 28-12 uh, to 12 was the final. Jared Goff looking like a good quarterback again, 22 for 31, 293 yards, two touchdowns and two interceptions with two rushes for four yards. Uh, running back Todd Gurley, 23 carries for 79 yards and one touchdown with four receptions for 34 yards. Now, speaking about Gurley, he's reportedly set to be, quote, used extensively through the rest of the season the last two games per NFL insider Ian Rappaport. Quote, limiting carries has worked. He's as fast now as he was in week one based on practice, practice metrics. 
But Lewis, is it a little too a uh, little too little? I should try that again. Is it too little too late for the Rams uh, starting Gurley up with the last two games of the season, hoping that he can carry them into a wild card berth? Yeah, I think so. I think it's you know at this point, forget about it. Uh, should have thought about that earlier in the season. Although I will give them credit, they they bashed the the uh, Seattle. I did not see that coming at all. Speaking of Seattle, running back Rashad Penny uh, apparently tore his ACL in the uh, in the loss, so that's a big loss, obviously for uh, Seattle. But they have, I think, like 900 other running backs, so they might be able to mitigate that loss. But either way, losing a player this late in the season that's played that big of a role, not good. No, that's going to be tough. That's going to be real tough. Now, moving over to our third of the three big things, the other NFL news of the week. Got a bunch of stats here for you to chew on. First off, the Los Angeles Chargers, their quarterback, Phillip Rivers, throws for 314 yards on his 38th birthday. He recorded the highest passer rating, 154.4, by a quarterback on his birthday in the Super Bowl era. A minimum of 10 passes is required, pass attempts required to qualify for this stat. Baltimore quarterback, Lamar Jackson, despite the fact that he was held down a lot by the Buffalo Bills, which we'll talk about on Trust the Podcast later this week, he becomes the second quarterback in NFL history with at least 1,000 rushing yards in a season. He is 23 yards away from breaking Michael Vick's single-season record of 1,039 rushing yards. Jackson also set the NFL record with his fifth game in a season where he recorded at least three passing touchdowns and at least 30 rushing yards in the same game. Lamar Jackson, hands down the MVP, no doubt about it there. I 100% agree with you there. Lamar Jackson, despite not looking fabulous, they still found a way to win. He still got some of his rushing yards in, and he's definitely going to break Michael Vick's single 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 season record before the end of the season is done. They play the Jets on Thursday, so I would I would presume it's going to happen there. But crazier Probably. things have happened. True, the Jets beat the Cowboys, but yeah, you're probably when the Cowboys aren't good though. So let's just be honest with ourselves. <laughs> just call a spade a spade right here, and just you know really lay it out for you. Well, you know what? The one thing, go backwards real quick. The one good thing they did was they did uh, uh, cut Bahar because that dude didn't know how to. You know what that? You know what that is? You know what that is akin to, Lewis? What's that? Rearranging the deck chairs in the Titanic. Pretty much, yeah. Like, they oh my god, the ship's going down, but this chair's this chair's out of place. We better fix it. It's like, oh, bro, the 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 boat just broke in half. So right, not yeah, gonna matter true, in about five minutes. They they did sign they did sign a uh, another subpar kicker. So good job. You know who they should you know who they should fire the coach. Yes, hundred percent. You know who Jerry Jones should fire himself. Hundred percent. Anyways, Washington running back Adrian Peterson uh, becomes the sixth player in NFL history to reach fourteen thousand rushing yards. He now has fourteen thousand and thirty six on his career. New Orleans wide receiver Michael Thomas eleven receptions on Sunday. He has 121 after 13 games. That's the most receptions recorded after 13 games in NFL history. He is on pace for a single season record of 149 receptions. Excuse me. Also staying in New Orleans, quarterback Taysom Hill recorded one reception for 12 yards in a loss on Sunday. Not a big deal, but it is because it marks the 10th game that Taysom Hill has recorded at least one reception, setting the NFL single season record for most games with a reception by a quarterback in the Super Bowl era. Pretty cool stuff for Taysom Hill. Yeah, no, that's pretty cool. Good for Someone's going to give that guy a big contract to do, be a Swiss Army knife. It's going to be great to watch. Yeah, that'll be fun. Moving over to Indianapolis now. Kicker Adam Vinatieri to have season-ending knee injury. Or I try that again. Adam Vinatieri to have season-ending knee surgery due to a knee injury. That was that was much better. Now, Lewis, much he's better. a... Vinatieri is a career low 68% on kicks made this season. Is this the end of the road for Vinatieri after 24 seasons, do you think? I don't know. I, I don't I don't know because obviously he has some knee injuries, which which resulted in his career low. If he comes back and he feels better, you, you might see him on the sidelines again. If that knee gets healthy, I think he's still a viable option to have it, it, on your you know on your team as a kicker. I don't even remember well, how old he know. is right now. Oh my goodness! He turns. He'll turn forty-seven years old this December. Yeah, I was gonna say he's like forty-seven. Him and my wife share the same birthday. I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, good for him. Yeah, absolutely. I I can't believe he's still playing at forty-seven. That's wild. But anyways, um, one last thing before 
one last thing before we move on here. Cleveland, wide receiver Odell Beckham Jr. reportedly wants to be traded away from the Cleveland Browns per Charles Robinson of Yahoo Sports. Quote, he's lost, a source told Robinson. Quote, fame got to him. He made bad choices. Now he has to redeem himself. And the road to redemption isn't an easy one when you have an ego. Right now, Beckham, 59 receptions, 844 yards, and two touchdowns. So he's still putting numbers up for sure. Uh, He's reportedly playing through, excuse me, a sports hernia that occurred in training camp. Excuse me. Wow. Um, sports journey that occurred in training camp. They didn't fix it for some reason. He's been playing through it. He's under contract for four more years, but there is a contract out in 2020 that looks like it only leaves Cleveland with about $2.75 million in dead cap. Uh, an artic- the article further reports, though, Lewis, that OBJ told one team to, quote, come and get me during a game in October. Mind you, the Browns faced San Francisco, Seattle, and New England that month. Would you, if you were an NFL GM, pull the trigger on an Odell Beckham Jr. trade? I would if I knew he was healthy. If you're playing through a sports hernia, that means that your core is messed up. If you can't run as fast as you normally would, you can't jump the size you normally would, uh, getting tackled has got to suck. Yeah, but so, you know, if, I, if, he, if he's been hurt all season and he's still putting up almost 1,000 yards, likely we'll put up another 1,000-yard season. Right. I think that kind of that kind yeah. of ship sails there. Yeah, no, I agree. I just, I would have to, for me, I would have to make sure that he was 100% healthy. I think for me, I would be totally. I think he's worth the money, what he is. I would be totally down with doing it. I just think it needs to be something. um, It really needs to be something that makes sense for the franchise that acquires him. I mean, if if he were to go to San Francisco, I think that would work. If you were to go to Seattle, I think that would work. I don't think New England um, would make that deal. I just don't. But that's just my opinion. They've done crazier things. That's true. They have done crazier things. But now, do we know what the status of Brady is? Is he going to come back? That's what I'm saying, too. If Brady doesn't come back, I mean, what's the point, right? Right. Because you're going to have who throw to OBJ. Exactly, exactly. Now, our look ahead real quick, because I got about five more minutes until my lunch is over here, so I got to make this fast. The playoff yes. picture, AFC, we've got Baltimore, who's clinched a, uh, clinched their division. Or no, they clinched a berth, but not the division yet. New England uh, at the two seed, Kansas City has clinched their division. Houston, Buffalo, uh, and then Pittsburgh wrapping out the top six. In the NFC, we've got San Francisco, Green Bay, New Orleans, who has won their division. Dallas, Seattle, and then Minnesota. And then, Lewis, the four big matchups of Week 15 here. We've got Houston, 8-5 and five at Tennessee, 8-5. and five. Winner takes the um, the Catbird seed, I guess, if you will, in the division race in the AFC South. You've got Houston uh, reeling from that Denver loss against Ryan Tannehill and the Tennessee Titans. I never thought I'd say that, but he's 6-1 and one in seven starts. You've got Philadelphia at 6-7 and seven against Washington, 3-10. and 10. We've talked about that before. Same with the Rams at 8-5 and five and Dallas at 6-7. and seven. If the Rams win, they stay in. They they stay. They need a lot of help, but they stay in the the wild card race where Dallas is trying to stay relevant in the NFC, uh, the NFC East. And then you have Buffalo at nine and four, and Pittsburgh at eight and five on Sunday Night Football. The best part about this one, Lewis, the NFL released it today on Tuesday. If Buffalo wins, Buffalo is in the playoffs. Right. You don't need any help. If you win, you're in. You're in. That's it. I think Crazy. this would be a good game. I think so too. I absolutely think that that would be a would be a lot of fun. Excuse me. Um, they'd be a lot of fun, and I think that uh, Buffalo has a really good chance to win. But they got to stop Devlin Hodges, which, like I said, we'll talk about on Trust the Podcast. I've got some fun stuff to chat with John about Devlin Hodges. So make sure you tune in for Trust the Podcast this week and every week. Uh, and this has been a hashtag ad. I appreciate you. <laughs> but hey. With that being said, I hate to, to end this so quickly, but like I said, I got to get back to work here. Uh, Lewis is at work, bro. absolutely. Lewis is at MRLG Perez. I am at Wolf BLTD. As always, we are better alive than dead. You're not. We will catch you sometime very soon. Thanks again for tuning in, my friends. The preceding presentation has been brought to you by the Gear Network.